It is indeed a very troubling report, but it is a report of extraordinary importance not only to those who wish to own a home, but as to the taxpayers of this country who would pay the cost of the cleanup of an enterprise failure. ...where, frankly, we were trying to fix something that wasn't broke. Mr. Chairman, we do not have a crisis at Freddie Mac, and in particular at Fannie Mae, under the outstanding leadership of Mr. Frank Raines. And, and as well as the fact that I'm just pissed off at Ophelio, because if it wasn't for you, I don't think that we'd be here in the first place. The best things in life are free. Also known as the Federal National Mortgage Association, is the largest non-bank financial services company in the world. It operates exclusively in the secondary mortgage markets, serving the single-family and multi-family housing markets. Pre-crisis Fannie Mae held $675 billion in assets while guaranteeing $700 billion in mortgage-backed securities. My name is Kay Shannon. And I'm Rudy Herrera Marmon. And today, we will discuss the history of Fannie Mae from the time it was chartered by Congress in 1938 to the current housing crisis in 2008. As well, we will give an in-depth analysis of moral hazard and the role it played in the housing crisis we see today. 1929, the financial house of cards collapses and the overinflated stock market plunges into a great depression. A financial panic grips the world. Fannie Mae was originally designed and created in order to help relieve the nation's housing problems during the Great Depression. In 1934, Title III of the Federal Housing Act allowed for a national secondary mortgage market to be created. Therefore, in February 1938, Fannie Mae came into existence. Their primary purpose was to establish a secondary mortgage market that would rejuvenate original lenders such as banks and savings and loans associations. What Fannie Mae would do is buy mortgages insured by the Federal Housing Administration from private lenders and either keep them for their own portfolio or resell them to private investors. This made private lenders confident again in the system which stimulated lending. As well, the secondary mortgage market created by Fannie Mae smoothed out the discrepancies between capital rich and capital poor regions in the country. For example, Fannie Mae could buy mortgages from the South or West who were struggling in this time period and sell them to the investors in the capital rich east. To help address challenges in the housing and financial markets, we announced temporary steps to help stabilize them and increase confidence in Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. In 1954, Congress passed the Federal National Mortgage Association's Charter Act, which turned Fannie Mae into a mixed ownership corporation. This changed voting ownership from the U.S. Treasury to mortgage lenders, who were now required to own stock in order to sell mortgages to Fannie Mae. In 1966, primary lenders became less liquid, to the point that they were unable to make new mortgages. Fannie Mae stepped up to the plate and bought up most of these mortgages, making them the largest buyer in the secondary market. However, the cost of borrowing enough money to purchase all of these mortgages was high enough that props dropped significantly. Yet at the end of 1966, Lending eased, which relieved the pressure on Fannie Mae. However, a year later, mortgage funds became once again scarce, and a dangerous cycle started to rear its ugly head. In response, Fannie Mae began a transition from mixed ownership to a private corporation in 1968. The Housing and Urban Development Act split Fannie Mae into two separate corporations. The first corporation of Fannie Mae stayed in the secondary mortgage sector, and the new company, called the Government National Mortgage Association, or Ginnie Mae, assumed the roles of special assistant functions, which guaranteed FHA and Veterans Association mortgages. The Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, now maintained regulatory power over this new Fannie Mae. Any stock, obligation, or other security had to be approved by the HUD. By 1970, Fannie Mae became a privatized corporation which had a board of directors with 15 members, five of whom were appointed by the president, further giving Fannie Mae the image of a government institution. In 1979, the U.S. began to see a drastic rise in interest rates. 
Because Fannie Mae's entire business plan is based upon borrowing money to purchase mortgages, it is especially vulnerable to rising interest rates. By 1981, Fannie Mae was losing millions of dollars because it would borrow at high interest rates and carry lower interest mortgages. The newly elected chairman, David Maxwell, decided to initiate several programs which transferred some of the interest rate risk from Fannie Mae to others. One main initiative was to buy adjustable rate mortgages, or ARMs. This was because the interest rate for ARMs varies. If the overall interest rate in the economy goes up, the homeowner pays more per month and vice versa. In addition, Fannie Mae responded by entering the mortgage-backed security market in 1981 in attempts to finance its mortgage purchases and to generate more income. Mortgage-backed securities, or MBSs, use assets as a form of collateral. These back the principal payment and interest payments of a set of mortgage loans through cash flows. Payments for such loans are typically made monthly over the lifetime of the loan. MBSs were more liquid investments and contributed greatly to Fannie Mae's income. By 1988, Fannie Mae issued more than $140 billion in MBSs. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac weren't giving out loans because they wanted to help poor people. They were giving out loans because they were making money hand over fist. In 1991, Fannie Mae launched the opening doors to affordable housing initiative. By 1993, they had produced $10 billion in purchases for low and moderate income housing. Housing experts and some congressional leaders now view those decisions as mistakes that contributed to an escalation of subprime lending that is roiling the U.S. economy. The HUD neglected to examine whether borrowers could make the payments on the loans that Fannie Mae classified as affordable. Subprime loans are targeted toward borrowers with poor credit, and they generally carry higher interest rates than conventional loans. Today, 3 million to 4 million families are expected to lose their homes to foreclosure because they cannot afford their high-interest subprime loans. Michael Barr, a University of Michigan law professor that is advising Congress, stated, For HUD to be indifferent as to whether these loans were hurting people or helping them is really an abject failure to regulate. It was just irresponsible. This was the first hit Fannie Mae took, and from there, they kept on coming. Moral hazard is an old economic concept which originated in the insurance business. A simple explanation of this theory is, if a person protects something or someone against an undesirable outcome, this person may behave carelessly regarding the safety of whatever or whomever is protected. For example, someone who buys a premium package from a car insurance company may drive recklessly because he or she feels financially protected. Or, a person with health insurance will be more likely to go whitewater rafting or skydiving. Similarly, investors who feel protected by implicit understanding that the Fed will bail them out are more likely to double their holdings rather than simply cutting their losses and pulling out once the market starts to drop. In order to understand this more clearly, let's look at the following equation and see the effect that risk had on the stock prices for Fannie Mae. In investment, the price of shares is determined by the following equation. Price is equal to earnings per share divided by the current bond interest rate plus the risk premium. When people perceive a company to have a constant level of risk, the price of its stock is stable. As earnings per share increase, the price of the stock will follow. Therefore, a constant risk premium with rising earnings per share will create expectations of future high prices. This was what investors perceived about Fannie Mae. Number one, a low and constant risk premium given its appeared backing by the government. And two, an increase in the earnings per share given that it was massively expanding its program of affordable housing. But let's put that aside and look at what was actually happening. The risk premium, which was expected to be constantly low, was actually high. The loans that Fannie Mae was giving were much riskier than they had claimed. This increase in the risk premium was so high that the rise in earnings per share could not counter the effect it had on the price. Instead of having the prices of stock increase, in reality, they fell. Let's take a numerical example to illustrate the changes. Based on investors' expectations, the price of stocks is defined as follows. The earnings per share are equal to 20, the bond interest rate is 0.05, and the risk premium is equal to 0.03. Given that the bond interest rate stays at 0.05, an increase in the earnings per share from 20 to 25 will increase the price of stock because the risk premium is expected to stay the same. Now let's take a look at what was actually happening. Beginning with the same original situation, we have earnings per share equal to 20, the bond interest rate is 0.05,
and the risk premium equals 0.03. If the bond interest rate stays constant and an increase in earnings per share occurs from 20 to 25, the difference is the effect of the risk premium. Instead of staying constant, the risk premium increases from 0.03 to 0.15. Ultimately, the effect on the price actually becomes the opposite of what was expected and falls dramatically. This, in turn, motivates investors to get rid of the shares. The scenario described previously is what brought down Fannie Mae. The actual idea that the Fed would bail out Fannie Mae was what caused a misperception of the risk premium. No one saw the fall in prices until it was too late. So you may be asking yourself, what was the tipping point at which the actual risk premium was revealed? Well, we must first remember that Fannie Mae had been issuing loans to provide affordable housing to people that were considered to be riskier than normal. This was not evident to investors because it was hidden under the notion of providing home ownership to more people. This, in combination with the crisis of the housing market, was what exposed the level of risk in many of the loans. Ultimately, the fall in prices of Fannie Mae's stock was what cost the firm its capital and what gave it no chance to recover from the losses it suffered. This is where the government stepped in and rescued Fannie Mae from its failure, making it the largest government bailout of a single enterprise in United States history. Fire it up, fire it up, when we finally turn it over, make a beeline towards the boulder, have a drink, you've had enough. Fire it up, fire it up, if you